Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. That very day, two of them were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to him, he said to them, what is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and of how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be croup condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with him went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all in the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when, we, when he talked to us in the road when he, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose again that same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together, and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told him what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be ever mindful of thee, O Lord, my strength and my salvation. Amen. Friends, this morning I want to talk to you about finding Christ in the world and the sacraments. Now, doesn't that sound awfully churchy? It, doesn't sound, it sounds like something a minister would say, but what does it really mean? How does it find its way in our life, flow from our experiences and our being? What's it all about? Well, that's what this reading tells us this morning from the Gospel of Luke. How do we know Christ? Let me set the scene for you. It's the last chapter of Luke. Jesus has died. He's died on the cross, and his body's been placed into a tomb. And two of his followers, Cleopas and another man, have just, how oh, they just don't know what to do. They've left Jerusalem. They're on their way towards the town of Emmaus, about seven miles outside of town. And they see a man on the road, and they begin to walk with him. And the man asks them, why are you so glum, John? And they said, are you the only guy in town who hasn't heard what's happened in, this, in Jerusalem? That they've crucified Jesus Christ. They condemned him to death. This is a man we've been following. This is a man we thought there was a Messiah. This is a man who performed miracles and deeds and, power and works of power. But he's dead. And we just don't know what to do. We didn't think it was going to end this way. So the Messiah is going to come and he's going to change everything. And he's dead. Now, one of them went on to say, well, we don't really know what's happening. Because some of the women from our community went to the tomb and they said his body was gone. And our friends went and they didn't, and, but they said they saw some angels. Well, some of our friends went, Peter and John, but they didn't see anything. 
Jesus uh, listens to them. And he doesn't reveal himself to them. He lets them go on. But he, after they're done telling this story of disappointment, he says, how foolish are you guys? Don't you know what the scriptures have taught us, the Old Testament has taught us from the beginning, from Moses forward, that the Messiah, God's anointed, must suffer, must go through all these trials, he must die, be hung from a tree. And the Bible says, as Jesus explained to them, he knows Jesus, but as this man explained to them the scriptures, they began to get it. Well, they finally got to Emmaus, and they said, well, friend, why don't you have dinner with us? And again, the man, Jesus, says, okay. And they continue their talk, and they break bread together, share a meal, and in the breaking of bread, Bible tells us, Jesus became known to them. And they were so excited after this, and as soon as they knew Jesus in the sacrament, he's gone. He's out of there. They run back to Jerusalem and tell the disciples that they have seen the risen Lord. He was made known to us in the breaking of the bread. And our hearts were opened to his power and knowledge through the study of the scriptures. So what does this mean to us? Well, let's put ourselves in the disciples' way of thinking. It wasn't supposed to be this way. The Messiah wasn't to suffer. He was to be a king. But for us today, we expect Jesus to suffer. We know the end of the story. And so their sort of disappointment, their brokenness, is we can sort of condescend towards them because, hey, they've got it backwards. But the difference is today, most of us, and I include myself, we don't want to suffer. We don't think we have to suffer. We think every day and in every way it's going to get better and better, that if we do this diet or follow this financial plan or do all these exercises, life will get better, we'll be happy, wealthy, and wise. And if we go to the right church and say the right prayers, it's all assured. This is what attracts people to these giant mega churches in Texas and places that, you know, if, if you send a thousand dollars, God is going to bless you a thousand fold. It's a give and get relationship. But friends, the Bible has never said this. Jesus has told his disciples, you will suffer. And that includes you and me. We're going to go through life. We're going to have bad things happen. We're going to be in places where we just can't see how we're ever going to get out of the pit. And like the disciples, we're blind. Blind to the presence of God. You know the hymn begins like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, and now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. These were the disciples. They were physically present with Jesus. They knew him. And you and I, sometimes, I know I do, say, well, I wish, it, I, wish I was there, because it would be so much easier to trust and believe if I could feel, if I could touch, I could see. But they were there. But they were still blind. How they could know Christ was through the study of his word, the scriptures, and through the sacraments in the breaking of the bread. We've got another story in the Bible from the book of Acts that basically makes the same point. It's about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. There was an Ethiopian eunuch. He was the treasurer of Candace, queen of Ethiopia. He was an African man going back to Ethiopia after having made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And he's reading the book of Isaiah in his chariot. And he's reading it out loud. And he pauses and says, I just don't understand this. And Philip stops him and he explains to him what it means and how these prophecies have been fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Philip explains the Bible and the Ethiopian studies it and immerses himself in the word and his heart is strangely opened and moved and he asks to be baptized. 
Christ. And Philip then performs the sacrament and he's baptized and then Philip's gone. And the Ethiopian unit continues on his way. It's the same pattern. Blindness dwells around us. Finding the opening the door, entering it through the Bible, and finding its culmination, knowing Christ in the sacrament of Holy Communion or of Baptism. See, friends, that's what the early church had. They had the scriptures and they had the two sacraments that Christ had told them about. Do this in memory of me. Take, eat. This is my body. This is my blood. Share the Lord's Supper and baptize one another and preach the word. Share the testimony of the Old Testament and of Christ's teachings about the kingdom of God. And that is how the disciples then truly knew Christ. And that's how you and I today can truly know Christ. Not by touching, not by feeling, but by opening our hearts to his word and participating in the sacraments. And then the door opens to us. But we don't, when things bad happen, we, I know me, I turn away from that. I know intellectually, and I think I know spiritually, but emotionally I want to be held, I want to be comforted, I want it to be fixed now. I'm a Christian, it shouldn't happen to me. I shouldn't suffer. Yet, I'm blind. Because the lot of a Christian is not a perfect life in the sense of happiness and wealth and prosperity. It is happiness, it is wealth, it is prosperity of the Spirit, of knowing Jesus, of being filled with his power, filled with his love being present with him spiritually. This is what the disciples teach us in this reading. That in our suffering, we allow ourselves to become blind at times and not see that Christ is there with us in our sufferings. Now, that doesn't mean he's, there's a Jesus prayer that can make you happy and happy and all goes away. Your sufferings are still there. But you're able to above them, be lifted high. This, friends, was my experience when I was paralyzed in a wheelchair, a paraplegic. I was so angry at Jesus. I was so angry at God, because why was this happening to me? I was one of the good guys. And here I was, not yet 50 years old, and my life was essentially over. I'd have to live the rest of my life on charity, on disability. I couldn't educate my children. I couldn't stay in my house. It was all over. And I was so mad. And yet, what happened? My heart turned to the Bible. And through God's word, I began the process back. Through participation in the sacraments, I knew Jesus was there. Now, I still suffered. I still had to go through rehab. I still had to learn how to walk again, all that good stuff. Was not, how should I say, destroyed. I had hurt. I was in physical pain. I wasn't happy. But I had peace because I knew Jesus Christ. And I knew that He was there for me. In some sense, I had worries, then I had no worries. It's just like this time. I wake up about five in the morning some days and I worry about the economy. Is it ever going to come back? I worry about this church. Are people ever going to come back? It'll be, I don't know how many months, one, two, three months before we have worship again, where people have lost their habit. Well, all the things about, that we have worked over the past five, six years to build this as a community of faith just poof, disappear. Because the economy's tanked. Because people have lost their habit. Because people are mad at the world. I get those worries. Some of you do too. I worry about health. But I'm in a funny place now. My daughters call me and text me and say, Daddy, don't leave home. Daddy, don't do this. Daddy, don't do that. They're worried that I'm going to get sick. 
but I'm not that worried about it, but I am worried about them getting sick, Laura, a nurse. Claudia in Seattle, one of the hot spots of the virus. Yet at the same time, I know that in Christ all shall be well. Julian of Norwich, Julian she was a woman, but Julian of Norwich was a for mystic, who wrote during very difficult times of famine, pestilence, and war. And her message was, culminates in a little saying, very simple, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all shall be well. That doesn't mean diseases will stop, wars will stop, the economy will boom. But it does mean that Christ is with us, and we need not be afraid. Friends, I appreciate the fear that some of us feel. I've been there too. Appreciate the uncertainty of feeling the anger at the world for being this way. But don't be like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, or Ethiopian unit, where you let your head in the right place initially, but your spirit, your heart is blind. In these times of uncertainty, in these times of fear, yourself in God's Word. Participate in the sacraments as you can, online. Engage in what the Church calls spiritual communion. Even though you're not physically present here, spiritually, when two or three are gathered together, Jesus is in the midst of them. That's happening. But friends, you've got to turn your heart to that way. See his power, live in his spirit, and find him in the breaking of the bread. Amen.